Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing endothelium-dependent vasodilatation. Okay, so we're now looking at the endothelium-dependent hyperpolarization mechanism by which endothelial cells with these calcium signals uh, can uh, cause hyperpolarization of the electrical potential difference across the vascular smooth muscle cell membrane. Okay, right. So we've just looked at the contact-mediated pathway of endothelium-dependent hyperpolarization. We're now going to look at the other pathway, which is prevailing amongst all the mess of pathways that have been discovered associated with this phenomenon. Okay, and this other mechanism involves a diffusible factor that is released by the endothelial uh, cells which causes hyperpolarization of the vascular smooth muscle cells. And this is known as endothelium-derived hyperpolarizing factor, EDHF. Okay, so this stands for endothelium-derived, that's the D, and then hyperpolarizing, that's the H, and then factor, hyperpolarizing factor. Okay, so there are loads of speculations for what could function as an endothelium derived hyperpolarizing factor. Okay, but the main ones, the ones that are prevailing above the others as the most likely main endothelium derived hyperpolarizing factor are what are known as epoxy icosatrinoic acids. Okay, and I now want to discuss how endothelial cells are going to produce these and what effect they're going to have on vascular smooth muscle cells. So, again, we now go back to the case where it's all of the endothelial cells which can produce this effect, because we've just been talking about the contact-mediated pathway, and that requires the endothelial cells to actually be in contact with the vascular smooth muscle cells, and therefore it was only the endothelial cells of the arterioles which could actually participate in that. But in the case of a diffusible factor, all of these endothelial cells can produce that, okay, and that can diffuse back to the vascular smooth muscle cells of the arteriole in this local area. Okay, right. Now, epoxy icosatrinoic acids are actually going to uh, be produced from arachidonic acid, okay? So, we've already met arachidonic acid, so remember, in the endothelial cells with these calcium signals, you get the activation of phospholipase A2, which then translocates to underneath the uh, phospholipid bilayer and then starts breaking down phosphatidylcholine to liberate arachidonic acid. Okay, and we've seen how the arachidonic acid can be acted upon by cyclooxygenase enzymes to produce prostacyclin or prostaglandin I2. Okay. But arachidonic acid can also be go down a completely different pathway to the cyclooxygenase pathway, and it's this that we now want to study. Okay, so, um, arachidonic acid, which I'll abbreviate down to AA, can also be called by a different name. Okay, and this different name is icosatetrinoic acid. Okay, icosatetrinoic acid. Now, what does this mean? Icosa means that it is a 20 carbon carboxylic acid. Okay, so icosanoic acid is a 20 carbon uh, carboxylic acid. Okay, the tetrene means that it's got four double bonds, so it's not a fully saturated carboxylic acid. Okay, and I'll show you the structure of this in just a moment. Okay, now, basically, we've seen how it can be converted into prostaglandin G2 and then into prostaglandin H2 and then on to prostaglandin I2, but it can also be converted to what's known as a Icos oh, whoops, missed off a bit, epoxy icosatrinoic acid. So epoxy icosatrinoic acid. Okay, and is it going to fit in? Nope. Trinoic acid. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that it's going to still be a 20 carbon carboxylic acid. So there's the icosanoic acid there. But now we've only got trinoic acid. And that means that we've gone from having four double bonds to having three double bonds. And we've now got this new structure, which is an epoxy group, and I'll show you what that is in just a moment. Okay, right. 
So basically there are enzymes within the endothelial cells which can also catalyze this conversion of arachidonic acid. Okay, and they are members of the cytochrome P450 family of enzymes, often abbreviated to CYP. Okay, so this is short for cytochrome, that's the CY, and then the P is for P450. Okay, and this reaction is specifically catalyzed by cytochrome P450 enzymes, which are called cytochrome P450 epoxygenases. Okay, now which families of cytochrome P450s are epoxygenases, which means that they create these epoxy groups. Okay, well, the specific families of cytochrome P450s which can catalyze this reaction are the cytochrome P452C family and also the cytochrome P452J family. Okay, so those are the enzymes which can catalyze this conversion of arachidonic acid into uh, epoxy icosatrenoic acids. Okay, so let me now show you then what an epoxy icosatrenoic acid is. But before we just go any further, let me tell you that uh, epoxy icosatrenoic acids are usually abbreviated down to EATS. E for epoxy, E for icosa, and then trenoic acids is T. Okay, so let me show you this reaction. So, we'll start by drawing the skeletal structure of uh, icosa tetrinoic acid, okay, arachidonic acid. So, it's this 20 carbon carboxylic acid. So, we'll start with the carboxylic acid group here. Okay, so that's carbon number one there, carbon number two is here, carbon number three is here, carbon number four, carbon number five, and then you've got your first double bond between carbon number five and carbon number six. Okay, now, I should just say something here to be correct chemistry-wise, okay? I have just told you that arachidonic acid can also be called icosa tetrinoic acid. Now, this is true, however, it's not quite rigorous, okay, because Icosa tetrinoic acid does not tell you where those four double bonds are, okay? And in the case of arachidonic acid, those double bonds are in a very specific position, okay? So let me show you now where the double bonds are, and then I'll uh, say that that's the real structure of arachidonic acid, although you can refer to it as Icosa tetrinoic acid. Strictly speaking, what you should have in some, at some point in this name is the numbers of the double bonds. Okay, right, so you have one double bond coming off the fifth carbon here, between the fifth and the sixth carbon. Okay, so this is the sixth, this is the seventh, then you've got another double bond between the eighth and the ninth carbons here. So this is carbon number eight here. Then we've got carbon number ten, carbon number eleven and twelve. Again, you've got a double bond there between eleven and twelve. Thirteen's up here, fourteen's here, and then you've got another double bond between fourteen and fifteen. So you can see how it's beautifully symmetric in this way, okay? Then we've got carbon sixteen here, and I'll just label that up as fourteen. Seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, and then twenty. Okay, so that is the structure of arachidonic acid. So strictly speaking, you should probably call it icosa tetrine 5, 8, 9, uh, sorry, 5, 8, 11, 14, noic acid, okay, so that you have the numbers of the double bonds. But everyone often does just call it icosa tetrinoic acid. Okay, right. So, how do you convert this molecule, and this is arachidonic acid, this is what arachidonic acid looks like, how do you convert this into an epoxy icosatrenoic acid? Okay, well, let me just write out the name again and then I'll show you what you can do. Well, basically, there are four different epoxy icosatrenoic acids that you can produce from arachidonic acid, and these you can produce by choosing different double bonds to break, okay? So remember, we're going down to just having three double bonds rather than four, okay? And one of the double bonds is going to be replaced by an epoxy group. But which one do you choose? Well, you can choose whichever one you like, basically, which means that there are four different eats that you can form. So let's say that we're going to choose this double bond between five and six to be broken, and let's show the eat that we can produce by breaking that double bond. Okay, so, this double bond has now been broken, so I'll just draw the structure out first, and then I'll put the 
epoxy group there. Okay, so here is the structure once again. Okay, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Here's the carboxylic acid group still, and now we've broken the second of the two bonds in that double bonds, and we're now turning it into an epoxy group, which is a group where you have a triangle like this involving two carbons and an oxygen like that. Okay, so this is what would be called a 5,6-eat molecule, epoxy icosa tetri sorry, epoxy icosatrenoic acid. Okay, so this is the 5,6-eat. Of course, you could also produce the 8,9-eat. Okay, which would be 8,9-epoxy-icosatrenoic acid, which instead of picking the double bond between 5 and 6 to break and replace by an epoxy group, you pick the double bond between 8 and 9 to break. Okay, you could also have an 11,12-epoxy-icosatrenoic acid. Okay, so there's 11,12-eat, and finally there is also 14,15-eat. And these enzymes, these cytochrome P450 epoxygenases, which remember we're in cytochrome P450 2C and 2J families, they are capable of catalyzing the conversion of arachidonic acid into any one of these four EAT molecules. Okay? So the endothelial cells can produce these EAT molecules in response to calcium, which causes the liberation of the arachidonic acid that uh, you need to make these. Okay, the idea then is that these EAT molecules go to the vascular smooth muscle cells and then cause potassium channels to open. And the identity of these potassium channels is still uh, controversial, okay? But the EAT seem to be able to cause potassium channels in the vascular smooth muscle cells here to open allowing potassium to leave the vascular smooth muscle cell cytoplasm and thereby hyperpolarizing the electrical potential difference across the vascular smooth muscle cell membrane and therefore stopping the activation of voltage-gated calcium channels in the vascular smooth muscle cell membrane and therefore stopping the generation of calcium signals which lead to contraction. Okay, right, so that now finishes our discussion of the mechanisms by which the endothelium can cause relaxation of the vascular smooth muscle cells surrounding the arterioles. As I say, this is something that is happening all the time, all over the place. Okay, the endothelium is continually sending these signals to oppose the continuous contraction signals that the vascular smooth muscle cells are receiving. And if you block the endothelium dependent relaxation mechanisms, you get massive contraction of arterioles all over the body and it causes a humongous great rise in arterial blood pressure. Okay, so it is important mechanisms that are occurring all the time to keep your blood vessels uh, open, basically. Okay, in addition, we've seen that you can upregulate the endothelium dependent relaxation mechanisms in response to inflammatory mediators, which is what occurs in the process of inflammation, and that's how you can increase the perfusion to areas which are undergoing the inflammatory response.